Sometimes failure is not an option. Sometimes failure has to happen in safe mode if it's going to happen at all. And sometimes failure is just the beginning of our problems. In a lot of industrial and safety critical applications, in order to save us from that F word, we need to take a real close look at our overcurrent protection. But the days of easy peasy overcurrent protection with a plain old fuse are long gone, my friends. But I probably didn't need to tell you that right? Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Today, proper overcurrent protection needs to include a lot more than just a fuse. Today's functional safety requirements demand an integrated overcurrent, thermal, and overvoltage protection solution. In this Chalk Talk, we're talking about how electronic fuses can solve all of these issues and also reduce your wiring needs, give you real-time current monitoring, and more. Please welcome Pramit Nandi from On Semiconductor. Pramit and I are digging into some serious e-fuse business today. So without further ado, let's get going. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about e-fuses from On Semiconductor. Hi, Promit. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Okay, so before we jump into the nuts and bolts of e-fuses, what particular challenges are we looking to solve here? So in overcurrent protection, there are several challenges, and especially with the footprint decreasing and increasing power densities, which is number of watt per millimeter square, there's always going to be challenge in overcurrent protection. So just having overcurrent protection by itself is not going to be enough now to guarantee the SOA or safe operating area of a system. So you need to have over voltage protection, in rush current protection, over temperature protection, and in many cases, reverse polarity protection. And of course, you need ESD and surge. But when you do that, you also have to now comply with safety standard or functional safety. So for doing that, you need advanced diagnostics, fast response time, safe state restoration, and of course, low fit rate, which is failure in time. So these are required for various market segments, industrial, automotive, avionics, and whatnot. All segments are going to require to comply with functional safety now. Now, the third challenge is while you meet the first two, maintaining energy efficiency is going to be more and more challenging. In order to meet energy efficiency requirements, you have to have low quiescent current. You need to make sure that you should be able to isolate the faulted line. And of course, indirect energy efficiency would be in terms of reducing the wiring. Okay, so it seems like every market on the planet needs safety standards these days. Are you seeing that as well? That is very true. It started with IEC 61508, which is an industrial functional safety standard, which of course evolved to different applications like nuclear programmable logic controllers or PLCs, variable speed motor drives, machinery, process industry, railway, which you can see in this slide. And slowly but surely, it also evolved into functional safety for automotive because, as you know, the electronic content is going up in automotive industry. So it needs to comply with that as well. So ISO 26262 is also a functional safety standard for automotive. Similarly, avionics and medical and home, they have independently developed functional safety standards that you can see in the screen. So every market and every application has its own functional safety requirements now. Okay, so I would imagine that functional safety looks different in a lot of these segments. But specifically, what does it look like from an industrial application? So in industrial applications, not every application is going to be safety critical. There would be certain safety critical applications, as you can see in the slide. So there are different levels field level safety, process control level safety, and of course that gets monitored by a supervisory system which comprises of workstation and engineering workstation and data acquisition. So from field side, if you look at this diagram here, uh, there are some safety critical applications which are highlighted in that uh, green triangle. Uh, Just to give an example, there could be uh, inflammable gas in a factory plant where you want to have a fail-safe situation, like if it leaks out, you want to shut off the valve in failed condition. So if it doesn't, then it can cause a lot of hazards or a lot of risk. So in that case, you want to make sure 
first of all, the failure shouldn't happen. So for that, you need to have proper diagnostics and also ensure that there's redundancy to catch that and also take over when the failure happens. And on top of that, if there is a failure, it should fail in a safe mode. So for that, you have safety critical IOs and of course, a safety critical controller by itself. As you can see, there's a safety PLC, which is in slave configuration here. Okay, so safety is huge in the automotive arena as well. But these safety functions are different for different areas, correct? You are absolutely right. Uh, As you can see in this particular slide, every application has its own level of safety requirements. As you see, ASILQM, ASILA, B, C, D. So QM and A being the lowest safety critical elements and ASILD being the most stringent one. So, of course, audio and infotainment will not require very high level of safety. Right. Same is true with kind of lighting. But as you move towards body control, ADAS, safety in chassis and powertrain, the safety level increases to B, then C, and eventually to D. So, every application would require different level of safety compliance. Okay. So, Pramit, for overcurrent protection, how are we going to fix these issues? Overcurrent protection has its own challenges that we explained before, but the traditional fuses cannot handle that or cannot meet those requirements. So there's something which we call it as electronic fuse or e-fuse is going to be the solution, especially for overcurrent protection. As I said, it is not just overcurrent protection. It has a lot of other features. So features like, of course, there's going to be short to ground, short to battery protection. There's overcurrent and over temperature protection. In many cases, not all cases, but you may have reverse current protection means you will have back-to-back FETs to ensure that in an event when you turn it off, it doesn't discharge backwards or the current flow doesn't flow backwards. Could be important if you have a large capacitor, which is, say, for example, storing some important data in SSD. When you turn it off, you don't want the current to flow backwards and discharge that cap, which is powering up something which is responsible for transferring data from cache to flash in an event when you turn it off. And also over voltage protection. So the e-fuses that on offers does detect over voltage and shutdown. We actually actively clamp it. So as you see that even if the input voltage climbs up, the output gets clamped at a certain voltage so that the downstream circuitry would never see a high voltage and go into over voltage stress. And of course, you want to report the fault. You want to have a power sequencing capability. For example, you want to power up a rail in a certain sequence. One rail powers up than the other one. It's for that you have power good. And of course, real-time monitoring of the current. For example, you want to implement a power limiting feature. You want to monitor both voltage and current. This feature can be used for that. Or you can actively monitor how much the load is drawing current in real time and implement some system level diagnostics to achieve functional safety. Okay, so you guys are moving beyond just the traditional application areas for e-fuses, right? That's true. So traditionally, we have been addressing the telecom, storage, and server markets. Now we have expanded into the consumer, automotive, as well as industrial applications. So here's like a block diagram of an e-fuse. So you have the MOSFET, the gate driver and charge pump, the inrush current current limiting block, which is DVDT is what we call it, then voltage clamping block, UVLO, thermal shutdown, and of course a block to do enable and disabling. So all these things are available in most of our, the cases in 3F, 3 by 3 solution for 4 to 10 amp continuous current and slightly higher current goes into 4 by 4. And then up to four or five amp, it goes into two by three package. So as you can see, they are very, very small and they save a lot of board space. Okay, so Pramit, can you walk me through how an e-fuse works? Sure. First, we discussed about all the features in the previous slide. So I'll walk you through each of these functions one by one. So first, let's look at uh, over voltage protection or over voltage clamping. So here you can see that the input voltage given to this e-fuse is 20 volts. And this particular e-fuse is programmed to clamp the output at 14 volts, irrespective of what the input voltage is. So you see the input voltage here. This is a scope shot. is at 20 volts and output stays clamped at 14. So if you have a DC-DC converter or whatever is in the downstream side for a 12 volt application, they would never see any voltage higher than 14 volts. There's also 
the response time, how quickly that reacts to an overvolted situation. Here you see that response time is less than five microseconds. So it's very, very fast. Yeah. The other side is, of course, overcurrent protection. So that's the main function of E-Fuse, right? So this particular slide shows that you have an output which is permanently shorted, and this E-Fuse starts into a shorted condition. That means you short the output and turn on the E-Fuse, goes into current limit based on what you program it at. So here it is, was programmed at around 12 amps, stays at 12 amps, maintains 12 amps till it goes into thermal shutdown. So it protected the load against a short circuit condition, even if the load is completely shorted. Overcurrent protection. Here we see a situation where you see that uh, it is operating normally and there is a short circuit event. So in this case, it was programmed to be around 9 amps. So it goes beyond that and it detects, oh, it tripped. And then it maintains a hold current at roughly 7.8 amp and then eventually goes into thermal sh shutdown. So it's mimicking a fuse like trip, Hold, shut down. Right. And how quickly it reacts to it? Very, very important again, less than five microseconds. Compared to any other technology, it responds much faster. The other is inrush current limiting or inrush current protection, which can be very important if you have a motor load where you can have high inrush current or you're doing a hot plug event and you have a large capacitor that you want to charge. So, in those situations, you don't want to go into very high inrush current. There is something that we call it as DVDT control. All we do is control the rate at which the voltage ramps up on the output. So here, by default, if you put no capacitor on the DVDT pin, it ramps from 0 volt to 12 volt in roughly 1 millisecond. And depending on your system, you can program it and your inductance level and type of load, whether it's reactive or not, you can program this time to higher value. So here, if you throw in a 47 nanofarad gap on the DVDT pin, it goes from 1 millisecond to 21.7 millisecond. That means it will take longer, so it will limit the inrush current for a longer duration. Okay. Similarly, if you have a hot plug event that happens, say, on the input side, for example, you have a hot plugging fan or hot plugging hard drive, whatever that is, you want to make sure that your device is safe by itself and also is protecting the output. So here you see that there's a current spike and due to the halt plug event on the input side, but there's no damage to the part and slowly the output you can see slowly ramping up so that any circuitry and after the fuse will never see that. Cool. And the other thing is reverse current protection. I think we described that in one of the slides for SSDs. So you want to quickly react to a reverse current situation. Sure. So again, you can see that as soon as the output tries to exceed the input voltage, there's a reverse current and it detects it and shuts it down within again five microseconds. The other aspect that is really cool about e-fuses is you can parallel multiple of those e-fuses and make them act as one e-fuse. Okay, interesting. Yeah, there's a feature which we call it as tri-state enable fault pin. In this case, you see as a 3.3 volt by default, it is at logic one. Whenever there is a thermal shutdown event, it gets pulled down to an intermediate voltage of 1.4. And if you pull it down externally all the way down to zero volts with a small FET, you can cause a shutdown or a thermal reset or you reset the fault. So the cool thing about this pin is this pin has a fan out of three. That means if you tie one of the enable fault pin with another three, then they will pull down as soon as one of them heats up it will pull down the other ones automatically and immediately. So that means even if one of them heats up faster, it will shut down the others right away. And then when you reset, they will all turn on together. So they work together as one fuse pretty much. Another thing is, of course, there could be layout difference. There could be statistical variation between RDS on between different variations or the same fuse. So there will be some small variations, but all those things would be compensated because even if one of them heats up faster, they will shut down at the same time. So ultimately, right. all you want is shut down together, start up together. Right. The other thing that you could do, even if you have, say, one 12 volt and one 5 volt, so you don't have to tie the inputs and outputs together. You just tie the enable fault pin together. So if you say 5 volt goes into short circuit condition, 
then you want to shut off the 12 volt right away. A uh, typical example for that would be HDD, which has a 12 volt and a 5 volt rail. Yeah. Any one of them goes into shutdown, you want to shut down the other one. So when you tie the enable fault pin of both the e fuses, although they are on different voltage rails, they will shut down at the same time. So you don't have to use any external logic to do that. Another cool thing about e fuses is the real time current monitoring. So many of our e fuses have this feature which allows our end customer to monitor the load current in real time. The way we do it is we have an internal current mirror which scales the current down by a factor of 1000. So one amp in load scales down to one milliamp and one milliamp flows out of this IMON pin and then you put a shunt resistor across this so that milliamp current would convert into voltage and MCU can monitor that voltage as a representation of load current. So this can be used to implement any system level diagnostics or to implement uh, some kind of logic where you want to monitor the current and the consumption of the load in real time. So here's an example with a reactive load, which is motor. So you have DC brushless DC motor. Here you have a startup or inrush current. So it's a really tiny motor which consumes about 0.25 amp or 250 milliamp. Even such a tiny motor when you start up shows a very high inrush current of 7.5 amp. That's several times higher than what it's continuous current. But when you put an e-fuse with its inrush current control, you can see that inrush current gets controlled to around less than 0.5 amp. So that's a huge, huge improvement. And that helps with a lot of things in the system level. Sure. So how does the performance compare with traditional fuses here? Traditional fuses come in various forms, melting fuse or polyfuses or PPTCs. So here we show a reaction to a short circuit condition, which we create with a 600 watt 20 amp DC supply. So melting fuse, when you create a short circuit situation, spikes all the way high up to 80 amps and then goes back and starts back a little bit and then eventually melts down and goes into open circuit. Polyfuses does a little better, I would say. They spike up to 58 amps. E-fuse, on the other hand, as you can see, only spiked up to 7 amp. So that's a significant improvement in the inrush current side. And that is because of its DVDT control, which is inrush current control, as well as the response time, which is significantly faster because that E-fuse is responding in microseconds as opposed to hundreds of milliseconds to a second for traditional fuses. Here is an example of uh, power dissipation versus time to shut down at different temperatures. All this graph is showing is, of course, at cold temperature, you can dissipate the same power and shut down slower. Sure. And of course, at a higher temperature, at the same power level, you will shut down faster. But there is consistency throughout is what we are showing here. Okay. So what about a hot swap controller? I know that can be an, an option here, but how does an e-fuse compare? Typically, hot swap controllers are something where you have the controller and the FET is located outside. And also the current sensing is done outside with a sense resistor. So of course, the amplifier and the monitoring circuitry stays in the controller and the gate driver stays in the controller, which drives the gate of external FET. So this is a good solution, but there are some issues that since the FET is located outside, it is kind of challenging to guarantee safe operating area of the FET. So you may have to over-design the FET and select a higher voltage or higher current capable FET to do the same application. And they tend to have advanced features and diagnostics. And the way they scale up the current is with using a bigger FET. They have very good tolerance in terms of current limit. But of course, since you have discrete solutions requiring controller, FET, sense, resistor externally, they tend to be more expensive. E-fuses, on the other hand, is always going to have the FET, which is inside the same package as the controller. So as a result, you can easily get thermal and current feedback from the MOSFET. So it is easier to guarantee SOA or safe operating area of the FET. And of course, the way you scale up the current is by paralleling the E-fuses, as we saw in the previous slide. And since everything is integrated, it tends to be smaller in size, so saves board space as opposed to the hot swap controller and tend to be more cost effective in many cases. 
Now, you mentioned wiring reduction earlier. So how does eFuse help with this? So in any application, wiring size or wire size is selected based on the rating of the fuse. Sure. So since traditional fuses have very wide tolerance, their hold current can be very, very high, and designers have to put in a lot of design margin on top of the nominal operating condition. And of course, the trip current tends to be even higher than the hold current, which is true for every case. As a result, you end up with a very high rating of the fuse. And of course, the system engineer will have to pick up a wire which is larger in size or wire gauge size has to be bigger. On the other hand, e-fuses are electronically controlled. They measure both temperature and current. So of course, they are going to be more accurate. So designer or system designer can leave lower margin between the normal operating condition and where they want to trip. So the tolerance is going to be less. So it would have lesser variance on the hold current side. And as a result, the overall rating is much lower than the traditional fuse rating. So of course, then the engineer can select wire size, which are significantly smaller in size or smaller in gauge size compared to regular or traditional fuses. Okay, so I know e-fuses must need to be very robust. How are you guys tackling this issue? That is true because e-fuses have to be on as long as the system is on. Right. There are many applications which run for 24 by 7. And in many cases, for example, if you have a hot plugging fan in an application, it could have a shorted condition and stay there undetected for weeks yeah. or for a few days. So you want to make sure that you don't break your system sure. or you don't break your board. So there is something that we do for our e-fuses per AECQ 100-12. It is called repetitive cold short circuit stress. All it is is you put the e-fuses in a chamber which is at minus 40 degrees Celsius and you start the fuse into a shorted condition. So the physics says anything you put at cold temperature, it contracts. Sure. And when it starts into shorted condition, it heats up to 175 degrees Celsius. So it heats up. So anything that heats up will expand. So contraction, expansion. So minus 40 to 175, shut down, cools down, starts back again into shorted, again heats up to 175, cools down. So that keeps on happening for more than 1 million cycles. Wow. And that is done with our auto retry version, which has a feature with a hysteresis on the temperature. So whenever it detects 175, cools down by a certain threshold, which is hysteresis, and starts back again. So that's a lot of stress on the package, on the die. And of course, there's also electrical stress at the same time. And we monitor key parameters, RDS on, quiescent current, every 100K cycle or so, till we complete 1 million cycles. And we make sure that it stays within the set limit for that standard. If it doesn't meet that, then we go ahead and redesign. So that's how we guarantee and make sure that e-fuses are very, very robust that we release into the market. Okay, so let's get into some applications. Now, you mentioned cloud in the beginning. What does that look like? So there are majorly four applications. So there's like a main fuse, which tends to be 50 to 60 amp. Typically a hot swipe controller or one of our e-fuses from on NCP81295, which can do more than 50 amp, is used here. So roughly 50 amps powering up this server rack here. And then you have multiple auxiliary fuses. All it is is basically if the main fuses goes into a trip condition, you power up the key elements of this server with these auxiliary fuses to run some diagnostics before you completely shut it down. So there is going to be fuses in both these applications here inside the server. And then the other side is on the hot plugging fan because every rack needs to be cooled down. So there's going to be multiple fans and sure. they are hot plugged. So whenever you do a hot plug, you need to have inrush current and overcurrent protection. The e-fuses go there as well. The other side is on the back plane. There are going to be several hard drives or SSDs that get hot plugged into the backplane. Mm -hmm. So these HDDs and SSDs are pre-charged. So whenever you do that, you want to have protection on the backplane for 12 volt as well as 5 volt for HDDs and only 12 volt for SSDs. And the same way, you need to have the same protection on the HDD side or the storage side because you want to protect the backplane from a bad drive. So in 
either cases you need to have the protection on both sides both on the storage and on the backplane so those are the four major areas where e-fuses go in today okay so what about any other application areas we talked about cloud inside clouds there is also raid and storage so e-fuses go in there inside storage like ssds we have e-fuses protecting the dc dc converter here and there's also e-scooter and e-bikes e-fuses are being used there for different applications like lighting and also the motor then there's also 5g and telecom application where you want to protect your power amplifiers so it could be the e-fuses would go in and protect those pas then in industrial automation you could have e-fuses on the 24 volt power rail for power supply protection as well as for io protection similarly you could have e-fuses for motor control and power tools industrial drones then there's also industrial relay replacement where you can replace a relay plus a fuse to drive some solenoid valves for a heavy industrial application then going to automotive they go everywhere like ADAS domain controller heads up display telematics as well as harness protection okay so from it what kind of options do i have for e fuses from on semiconductor on semiconductor offers e fuses for various current levels as well as voltage levels so here is a slide which shows e fuses for 3 to 5 volts so on the y axis you see the current so as you move up the current goes higher and on the x axis as you move from left to right you see the features are getting more and more rich so traditionally we had nis 5135 for 68 milliohm for 2 to 3 amp 5 volt application then we released 35 milliohm 5452 5431 all these have programmable current limiting, programmable inrush current, fault reporting, and of course, over voltage protection, under voltage, over temperature protection integrated. Mid to late last year, we released NIS 6150 and 6350, which on top of these features also provide digital enable disable reverse current blocking for preventing backward flow of the current from output to input, and IMON. Or real-time current monitoring feature so this is typically for one one and a half amp 6350 is for up to three to three and a half amp and going up and 6450 to 32 which will be releasing this quarter for four amp continuous current for 3.3 as well as 5 volts then looking at 12 volt to 24 volt e-fuses same way the y-axis shows the current and the x-axis on left to right the features get more and more rich so traditionally we had the NIS 52, 32 and 51, 32 with 44 milliohm with programmable current limit, DVDT, enable fault reporting capability, fixed over voltage and over temperature protection all integrated. And these are for 3 to 4 amp continuous current. Then we realized that the industry needs higher current now for various applications and yeah. we wanted to expand our portfolio. So we released NIS 58, 20 with 8 amp continuous current capability. 5020 with 10 amp continuous current capability and a slightly bigger 4x4 5021 with up to 12 amp continuous current capability. The great thing is all these are in the same footprint. All the 3x3 are pin-to-pin -pin compatible. So makes it easier for our customer to swap out and put in the higher current rating device right away. Absolutely. We are also releasing the NIS 5420 series. The additional feature that we are adding is real-time current monitoring. And this will also have a 24 volt version, which can do 24 volt for industrial applications. And then 6420, the additional feature on top of IMON is reverse current blocking and digital enable disable. So it goes and can go address all these markets that I'm showing on the right side here. So how do e-fuses fit into the overall overcurrent protection ecosystem at On Semiconductor? Here we see where we are today. So in terms of continuous current, so on the y-axis, in the operating voltage on the x-axis, so you're already addressing the one which is highlighted in green for various applications across various segments. And slowly but surely, we will be also dealing with higher voltages like 48 volt, 36 volts, different voltage rails at higher current levels. So as we see that the voltages are scaling up, we want to also address those. That's how we are moving in that direction. Okay, great. Well, Pramit, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. 
And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about electronic fuses from On Semiconductor. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.